For this next session, we're going to do a deep dive into the factors that fuel homelessness and uh, what communities can do to find sustainable solutions to the problem. We're joined by three speakers who are going to outline the, the challenges in Missoula and the region around this issue. First, Jim Hicks is the executive director of Hope Rescue Mis Mission in Missoula, which he joined after 40 years of pastoral ministry. Jim says his past pastoral journey has allowed him to develop a wide perspective on biblical leadership and its powerful impact on people. He brings this heart and passion to serve to his work at Hope Rescue Mission. Next, Kaya Peterson is the executive director of NeighborWorks Montana. Established in 1998, NeighborWorks advances housing opportunities for low and moderate income Montanans by providing attainable home ownership programs, financing and development, and preservation of affordable homes. And then next to Kaya, Julie Pavlish is the operations and program director of Homework, an organization that uses sustainable methods to strengthen Montana communities by teaching home buyer education and financial skill building and creating safe, healthy homes for people and communities. Thank you all for being here today. I know that Kaya and uh, Julie have presentations that they're going to be sharing with us, but I wanted to start with Jim because everything that I've heard about you and your reputation in Missoula and your work, um, I think will help us set the tone for this conversation because you told me you've been here about 16 years. Mm -hmm. um, you lived elsewhere and you come into a, a community like Missoula. Take us to that moment and what you saw in terms of this issue, community, and uh, whether or not people have safe and secure housing. Yeah. Well, welcome to Missoula. It's the, uh, the center of the universe, if you haven't discovered that yet. It's a wonderful place. And we've watched it change from 16 years ago to perhaps I did not see the unhoused and the homeless uh, until uh, about five years ago when I began to see them. Now, did it grow? Yes, I, I think the population grew. But what grew even more was my passion in seeing them. And uh, the migration for me probably was, oh, what's wrong with you? Get a job. To migrating to what happened to you. And then migrating further to what are you missing? And then how can we fill that in for those that want to go forward? So I think like uh, many places, it is mental health, it's affordable housing, it's life choices, it's uh, substance use disorder, it's all of those things that uh, combine. And here in Missoula in particular, here we are in Western Montana, and uh, while people in Western Montana would come to Missoula for services, so will those that are unhoused from Western Montana. So in our pit count, our point in time count, uh, we learned that 80% uh, of those unhoused in Missoula are Montanans mm -hmm. and Missoulians. So, you know, the, the, uh, of, of course, if you, you, you see the cross and Hope Rescue Mission, I have a, a, a big foot in the world of the conservatives, and uh, they're all saying, you build it and, and they'll come, it's, it's your fault. Uh, some of us in this room know what that's like to have the pitchforks come after us, um, which is ironic. Uh, <laughs> because they think, if you build it, they'll come, and we're going, no, we're building it because they're here. And uh, our, our particular uh, field with the temporary safe outdoor space is we endeavor, our roadmap is this, street to shelter to recovery to stability. That's the big roadmap that drives us. How can we learn uh, who they are on the street, build a reputation with them, 
to maybe uh, ask them to come into a shelter. And from that shelter, when they begin to see some safety and stability, then what are they missing in order to get them through the recovery piece, whatever that might be uh, for them, and then get them into stability. And it's a continuum of care. Uh, we all need each other in the midst of this. And that is one of the fortunate things I believe we have here in Missoula is the partnership and collaboration uh, to work together to see that this happens. We're not siloed. Uh, we try not to be siloed in our giving, like we were talking about. It's uh, in an our, our going after grants, but seeing that we all need each other in this continuum of care to, to help people go from the street to stability. And uh, get to mm -hmm. that inflection point, that moment when you say, I began to see. Mm -hmm. um, in this kind of, of environment, a conservative, a largely conservative state, um, overwhelmingly uh, white population, et cetera, I wonder if there's an additional barrier when it comes to homelessness in that, again, that perception that it's black and brown or it's poor people or it's in a big city or whatever. Was that part of why it took you a while to pivot and see homelessness for what it was? Um, that may be there. Uh, I'm going to just talk about my pivot is, uh, so don't, <laughs> don't hold this against churches, but it wasn't until after I got out of the, the church, per se, as a professional role, when the churches uh, are so focused on Sunday to Sunday instead of Monday to Monday that uh, you, I didn't see people. So I, I, for me, that was the barrier. There, there may be others, but it was actually... Uh, walking with and, and beside and having friends that were unhoused to begin to see and then have that move us forward in, in helping others. You, if you don't see a problem, you can't name the problem. And if you can't name the problem, you can't begin to uh, serve and help in the problem. And that, that's the migration of... of uh, what we've done, and then we, we carry that on in our staff at Temporary Safe Outdoor Space, Drop-In Center, Recovery Center, uh, the different things that we have. Now, in this climate and in this, this environment during the winters, what are the unique challenges of providing support and, and housing for people during those winter months? Mm -hmm. um, let, let, me, let me go the opposite. And when we provide, we had, tents in the winter with some safety and shelter and this man in mid 40s climbed out of his tent and said this is the best night it was about 20 below with snow on the ground and he climbed out of his tent and said this is the best night's sleep I've had in years because he had some security he had no way was going to pilfer his stuff. Uh, he knew he was going to be okay. So if, if, you, if you come to Missoula or if you're from Western Montana, you're ready for that, which to me speaks to it is, it is our neighbors. Uh, I, I, I have met people that have come in from other places and they've, they've come to me uh, about mid-December and say, how do I get out of here? Because <laughs> it's starting to get cold. But we have many people, uh, again, that are Montanans. They know what they're getting into. They know what the winters are like, and they're able to survive in the midst of that. That said, we have had some losses. And I, I want to say we haven't had any losses because of, of freezing for the last four years. So we're, we're grateful for that. Can I ask you, before we go on to the other two presentations, about the demographics of the unhoused, the population here in Missoula. I know that um, industry, timber and others have sort of eroded and so a lot of people are unemployed and, and whatever, but uh, is it across the age range? Is it young families? Is it older people? Tell us who they are. Yeah, it's uh, surprisingly, I didn't know how many older people there would be, but there's quite a few older people. The other side of that, uh, from our slice of, of this uh, challenge, this opportunity, 
is those that have aged out of foster care. And for all kinds of reasons we could talk about, they're dropped on our doorstep. And so we've had to pivot uh, with our temporary safe outdoor space, which is 30 hard-sided shelters, 100 square feet, uh, invite you all for a tour, uh, that we've had to pivot a bit to open it up for the, those, those folks getting, uh, getting aged out of foster care. But it's, it's, it's older people, it's disabled people, it's people that are uh, chronically homeless, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's people that, uh, for here in Missoula, with the kind of little boom that's going on, uh, for example, uh, we were having a meeting with our temporary safe outdoor space people, and I asked our director of outreach, I said, April, why is the social worker here? And I didn't, I didn't care if they were there, I just didn't know her. And I said, why is the social worker here there in the back? And she, she nudged me and she goes, that's not a social worker. And I said, what? Well-kept gal, hair well-kept, I go, what, what, what's going on? Uh, a mother with two children, the landlord came to her, said, I am so sorry, I got a cash offer. And so she was out and couldn't replace on her income uh, a house at that point. And so we had her there uh, for a couple of months. So just, boy, it's all over the place. It's hard to pinpoint uh, what it might be because it, it covers, the whole, covers the whole age range. I encourage you all, um, simply because we did a... Um series of fellowship programs on the future of the American child. And uh, one of the main themes was foster care, the child welfare system. If you have not done that story, go back to your newsrooms and look into the well-being of um, people who age out of care. Where do they go? What supports are there? What resources are there for them? It's, it, you would probably be surprised at what a significant percentage of the unhoused in your communities uh, fit that profile. So before we, one last one for you before we go on. Um, what stories are you not seeing in the media that should we should be seeing about homelessness? Um, I, I would just say, from my perspective, the broken systems. The, the broken systems that, that uh, allow these folks to fall through the the, the cracks, and then again, nobody see them. Uh, let's, let's get them out of sight, out of mind, uh, and that kind of philosophy uh, is detrimental to, because what if, what if at some point you and I are out of sight, out of mind, who's gonna help us, for whatever reason that might be? So I would say some of the broken systems, uh, and for, for me that comes down to relationships. What, what relationships are we not seeing or we're missing or we are avoiding? Um. I hope you all are going to interrogate Jim just like I am once we get through with these because again, a wealth of stories and insights and uh, things that you'll be able to communicate. But why don't you trade seats with Kaya and then Kaya, let me let you take it away for your presentation. Okay. So is this one? Oh, here's the clicker for you. Okay, great. Okay, hi everyone. I am Kaya Peterson. I'm the executive director of NeighborWorks Montana. And we are a statewide attainable and affordable housing organization. We've been um, serving Montana for 25 years. So our work is not on homelessness and houselessness. We work on the rest of the housing spectrum. You may have been hearing more lately about how homelessness is a housing problem, or you heard Jim speak to all of the underlying issues and certainly rising housing costs are leading to an increase in homelessness. So we focus on the rest of the housing spectrum. Um, we, where do I point this? There we go. Uh, just for some context of scale and scope, we have 20 staff statewide. Um, I'm here in Missoula, but we're all over, including in many of our rural communities. But I wanted to start with a picture of home. So this is my childhood home. I grew up in suburban Minneapolis and uh, sort of the traditional picture of the American dream, right? Look at those window boxes. Look at those Adirondack chairs. Um, it was a really wonderful upbringing. 
I lived here from second grade to ninth grade. And then in ninth grade, my parents got divorced. And my mom moved into an apartment. And from there, I lived in a lot of different types of homes. In college, I lived in an old house that had been converted into a triplex. I lived in a dorm. I sought a lot of adventure and spent a lot of time out in the wilderness. Um, so we have a lot of ideas about what home is, right? We each have our own story of home. We, um, and we have lots of different homes and houses that serve us at different times in our lives, when we're pursuing an education or a career, or when there are disruptions in our family or in our community. And I think this is something we really work on at NeighborWorks Montana, this idea that there are a whole lot of different types of homes and houses that are needed to meet individual and family and community needs. We need to really um, be aware of the, the stereotypes and the ideas we have about what a home is. So this is where I live now. I've lived in Missoula for 16 years. Um, here we go. So NeighborWorks Montana also started with a pretty traditional vision of home ownership. We started by providing very small down payment assistance loans to help people become first time home buyers. 25 years ago, we could provide a $1,500 loan and that was enough to fill the gap for low income households getting into home ownership. As you all know, that is definitely not the case today. Um, we're typically having to provide upwards of $100,000 in down payment assistance for one household and that's to serve people at middle income. So our dollars are going not as far to meet the same um, type of household and housing goal that maybe we could serve 25 years ago. That's still a really important pathway. It's still a really powerful program, but we have really had to expand our vision of what home ownership looks like. Here we go. Um, so in addition to down payment assistance, we now provide financing for a whole range of housing projects. We're what's called a community development financial institution, a CDFI. You likely have those in your communities, in your states. And our role is really to provide capital and access to capital to the communities and the people who have the least access and who need it most. Um, so often that's low income households and low income communities. So now we provide financing to help with development of affordable housing um, and with a variety of other types of housing projects. It's not just about financing though, it's also about how do we support people to be successful long term. We want people to get into a home and we want them to have stability in that home. So that takes a lot of planning, financial coaching, um, and services long term. And then we do a lot of work with manufactured housing, which I'll also talk about. So resident ownership is a concept that you may have heard of. Um, we have been providing resident ownership for residents of manufactured home parks, trailer parks, for probably about 15 years. And it's built on a model that was established in New Hampshire. So this is also a model that is probably happening in many of your communities. Um, it's a way to help existing residents gain stability. So you heard Jim tell the story about the resident who was displaced from their home because their home went for sale, right? Same thing in these communities. Many manufactured home parks are um, being redeveloped or being sold to investment firms or other outside buyers and residents are being displaced either because properties are being redeveloped or because rents are being raised beyond a level that's affordable to those residents. Um, so we have now been able to support 21 manufactured home parks across the state that are now <laughs> resident owned. Our 22nd will be closing next week and over 800 households living in these communities. Um, I think it's a really powerful model. You're creating a new home ownership pathway. You're creating a place where people are really coming together in community and where people are building their own individual leadership as members of their community boards. Um, we often hear in these communities, I didn't know my neighbors. And you think, well, you lived right next to them for 30 years. How did you not know them? We may all say the same. I have neighbors I haven't met yet. Um, but once they uh, engage in this program and become owners together, they really value that community connection. And I think there's a lot of um, strong benefits to that. So 
Oh, from there, oh, going backwards. Here we go. Oh. My kids always accuse me of my, my impatience with the buttons. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so from there, again, as we think about what are the pathways to homeownership, what are the pathways to stability and affordability, um, housing cooperatives have been another area that we've gotten really interested in. So we've taken that resident ownership model from manufactured home parks and applied it to apartment buildings. So again, it's a preservation strategy, it's a anti-gentrification strategy, it's a um, resident ownership strategy that we found to be really powerful. And we can talk more about that as folks are interested. So here are some of the things that I think are really interesting and exciting in the housing space. Um, housing cooperatives, community land trusts are another model. In the two cooperatives we established here in Missoula with apartment buildings, we did those in partnership with a local community land trust. Um, and that creates another layer of affordability and also community um, accountability and engagement. Native Home Ownership Coalition um, and Native Home Ownership, I know you're gonna hear from Angie Main, I see her back here. Um, and there's a lot of really important work happening on in tribal communities around housing opportunities, including home ownership. Rural communities are a space we often don't see as well represented in stories and in media. And I know many of you are in communities with large rural populations. Um, the, there's some really great work happening. You know, rural communities face different challenges, but they also have incredible housing, housing issues and needs that I think it's helpful for us to elevate and address. And then I just put match savings accounts. Sometimes when we're talking about housing and housing solutions, we have to look sort of one step beyond that. And for us, that means what are the supports and what are the steps that residents need in order to secure stable and affordable housing? And sometimes that means other types of programs. So in our case, helping people build savings um, is one really critical piece of the puzzle. So housing is in all the headlines. Um, usually the pictures look like this. It's a picture of a housing development. We really encourage people to think about who's living behind those windows mm -hmm. because housing is really a human issue. We all have, our, like I started with, we all have our own stories. We all have our own experience with home. Um, and elevating not only the, the development and the data, but the individual stories of who is this affecting and why has, is really critical to getting people engaged um, and, and to telling, giving people the full picture of what we're dealing with. So uh, just a couple more pieces here. Um, I was asked to talk about, you know, what are the key drivers of housing and affordability? So you'll hear people talk a lot about supply and demand. Those are definitely factors we see here in our environment. Montana and many of the places you live are places people want to be and want to live. So the demand is increasing. We've really lacked um, the amount of development and new homes that are needed. I think a piece of that is the underlying regulatory environment. And then certainly the relationship between wages and housing prices is a huge um, piece of this issue too. So slow wage growth and um, the need for access to good workforce jobs is a piece of that puzzle. And then you heard in my story about down payment assistance and the dollars, um, government and philanthropic dollars just don't go as far. There's more need and there's not really that much more in terms of dollars and resources. So we have to really stretch those dollars a lot further. Stories that I'm watching and that I'm interested in seeing more about, um, zoning and planning, it's not sexy, it's really technical, but it is, I think, one of the most critical elements of um, mm -hmm. what's contributing to housing affordability or lack of affordability. And it's very local. So it's, uh, this is playing out in every local municipality, every state government. Um, so it's hard to cover, right? It's, there's so much happening. Um, but it is, it is a place where I think we need to put more attention and really understand the, the underlying issues that are um, contributing to the current crisis. Employer-based housing solutions are really interesting. We can talk more about that, but we're seeing more employers get involved in this space, sometimes with great solutions, sometimes with ones that maybe aren't as great. Building innovation, we need to um, find new ways to build and build efficiently and effectively and address things like climate resiliency. Um, 
and then diverse housing types. So I kind of started there and I end there because I do think it's such a critical, critical piece of this work. Let's get away from this idea that a single family home is home ownership and a multi-family property is rental. There's all different kinds of um, living situations and ownership and um, housing types that uh, are part of our community fabric and community need. And I think that's it. It's about the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Lots to think about. Now let's uh, go to Julie at this point. Do you guys want to trade seats? Well, first, I just wanted to welcome all of you who have traveled from far away. I hope that your days in Montana are beautiful as we enjoy. Fall is always my favorite in Missoula as we get the color changes that come in and those nice long days. So welcome and thank you all for coming. It's a long trek. <laughs> All right, so Homeward is a nonprofit based out of Missoula. Um, we use sustainable methods to strengthen Montana communities by teaching home buyer education, financial skill building, and creating safe and healthy homes that people can afford. We are a 12 person team. We are 30 years old. We've, we just had our 30th birthday. And we work across the state, both in our uh, programs and in our development work. So I'll talk a little bit about development. Um, communities are stronger when everybody has a safe and healthy home that they can come back to. That's, that's just what we believe and what we strive for. So over the past 30 years, we have created or preserved over 1,500 homes, 32 properties, multifamily and home ownership opportunities. We're in 14 communities. Um, those provide homes for 2,000 Montanans, including 600 children currently. So we're really proud of that work all across our state. When you think we have just over a million people, is that right? So 2,000 is substantial when you start looking at numbers. And it's a lot of miles. <laughs> so we strive in our building. It's not just enough to create a box to put people in. <laughs> that, that's not enough. Uh, home really matters, and that means having safe and healthy places for folks to come back to that are sustainable not just for our current humans that inhabit this area, but will continue to be available for homes for people in the future. So we strive really hard to use beautiful design, green spaces, safe and healthy materials, so products that don't off-gas are free of toxins, we use things like solar power in many of our properties to help offset the energy costs to help keep those homes more affordable beyond just the rent. But when you factor in the utility and usage, it gets cold here. <laughs> and being able to harness that power of the sun uh, really makes a difference in people's day-to-day -day kitchen table pocketbooks. So at our Home Ownership Center, we, um, I was the home buyer educator at Homeward for the past six years, recently transitioned into our operations and program director. Um, so I am really proud of the work that our Home Ownership Center does, having been in the trenches of this program for a long time. We don't do emergent services at Homeward, so when folks are in emergent crisis work, we certainly help identify them. We do do work through our programs, our one-on-one -on -one counseling, especially around credit repair, to help people be able to access uh, apartments. If you're on the list and there are 20 candidates and your credit doesn't look very good, the chances of you even getting to see a home that might be affordable for you is a problem. So we work really hard with folks uh, in the spaces with Hope Rescue Mission, with our Missoula Interfaith Collaborative, with our 211, to make sure that people have access to the knowledge they need, the information, to be empowered to make the best choices for them. So that's really what we strive through for both our classes and our one-on-one -on -one counseling, meeting people where they are, getting them the education that they need so that they can make those good choices for their lives. So through our Home Ownership Center over the years, we have seen more than 20,000 people, again, only a state of a million, I'm really proud of that statistically, <laughs> who've come through our doors. Um, every year we empower over a thousand people through that coaching in classes. Um, 
So our Get Ready for Home Ownership class, it's a nine hour HUD certified course. We pack it, if any of you want to take it, we offer it both in person and on Zoom. <laughs> so it's an excellent opportunity to see the kind of information that we're delivering to communities throughout the state. It's offered monthly, it's $35 a person, um, and we work partner, partnering always, <laughs> with our community experts to make sure that market to market, it's so different. Buying a house in Missoula County versus buying a house in Ekalaka, <laughs> those are very different markets to be buying in. So it's important that we have counselors and uh, like experts in these fields available for the places that people want to buy their homes at. So we work really hard to build those partnerships and bring them in. Our financial skill building class, my colleague Katie teaches those. Um, we do them every other month. They are free statewide and all on Zoom, so they are highly accessible. They are also an eight hour class. <laughs> and they are soup to nuts, the whole, everything you ever wish you wanted to know about your money, but feel like you missed that day in high school and you're always catching back up. <laughs> Um, they're a really wonderful class. They help our participants be able to laser focus their limited resources, whatever those may be, on their highest priority goals. Um, so whether that is home ownership or something else, we want to strive to help people make sure that they're maintaining their quality of life as well as to reach home ownership if that's a goal for them. So resources. We can't do it alone. There's only 12 of us on staff. Most of us are building, some of us are maintaining our apartment buildings, and then we teach our classes. So without our critical partnerships, there's no way that we could be as successful in this work as we are. We work very closely, as you guys can imagine. We need money to be able to put buildings in place, so our NeighborWorks Montana partnerships are absolutely vital. Uh, our social services agencies, uh, Hope Rescue Mission, our Missoula Interfaith Collaborative, um, our city and county partnerships. You all just had our city up here and they're doing extraordinary work in partnership. They come and ask us questions. We do the same of them, which is great. Um, our government representatives, housing agencies and advocates all across the state. It's so important to have those. And not at our local level, yes, but we work statewide and so and Helena in our state capital, those relationships are just as important um, as we work together. So resources, we have our people. We also need our dollars. <laughs> so we collaborate, we work for dollars from all, from many different angles. We use housing tax credits, um, the LIHTC dollars, things like that. We use um, HUD programs, in-kind gifts, fees for service, uh, mortgage financing, low interest rate loans, pu public-private combinations, um, federal dollars, sponsorships, grants, and individual donors. Many of our program partners uh, give us even just donations at $5 a month once they've gone through our classes and counseling because they know how impactful that was in their life and they want to pay it forward so somebody else who may not be able to today can't. So we're, that individual gifts is, again, something we are just really proud to be able to build and bring uh, our community members, making sure we're helping each other. So I thought you guys might want to see some of the part, like here in Missoula, where you can drive by and actually see a few of these if you would like to. One of our most recent developments was the Trinity Apartment Complex. It was 202 homes with 30 permanently supportive housing homes. Does that, everybody know what that means? That means that that home has a voucher attached to it. So the person walking in there does not have rent to pay until they have the financial resources to pay rent. So um, 30 of those that are available for chronically homeless in our community, folks who have been living on the streets for many years. Um, so Blue Heron is a really special place as part of our Trinity. Um, homes, they are complete. They are currently occupied. Blue Heron Place is sitting at over the last year. They started operation in 2003. To date, they have had a vacancy rate of 0.05 of a percent. They have had 44 vacant days in the last like 8,080, something like that. So these homes are definitely being used and we're, we're putting them to good use for folks. 
The Bats Block is another really great example, not in the Missoula community, but in the Great Falls community, where we are preserving both historical architecture and homes that are affordable for folks. It will, this modeling it after our experience with Trinity, Great Falls got excited and we'll be offering 25 permanent supportive vouchers for the apartments in these, um, the homes in this building. It's currently under construction. I wish I had one of them right now. Um, it's been the coolest one to watch because you never know what you'll find in old buildings. It's pretty great. <laughs> it's a wonderful one. Um, and again, provides being able to take things that would otherwise be torn down or not necessarily sustainably repurposed and being able to bring new life to one of our downtowns, one of our small rural downtowns. The Creekside Apartment Complex is another success story right here in Missoula, actually just across the river over here that you'll see. This is one that we are currently in the financing and developed like pre-development stages of. Um, we actually purchased this at market rate when it came up for sale after being in the affordable homes for 30 years, Kaya? Creekside? Yeah. I think it was an affordable apartment complex for 30 years. Came up for sale at market rate. All of those residents, there's 161 homes, were going to go market rate from after having been affordable in our community. So Homeward got together the financing package and were able to actually purchase it to continue that affordability period for the building and provide those homes. In addition, we are putting on our sustainable, safe and healthy home spectacles <laughs> and are gonna be taking this property that had been maintained as affordable housing sometimes is. And we are really working hard to make sure that these meet the standards that Homeward is set for our communities of those safe and healthy homes. So we're gonna be doing a huge rehab to make sure that this, this property maintains that for the next 50 years coming down the line to provide affordability right here next to our beautiful river. So those are all some things that we're kind of doing. Um, we, we always keep it up there, sir. You know, all the pertinence. <laughs> if you wanna know more about us. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit about what we are and who we, what we do. I, let's <laughs> give them all. This is gonna be in conversations like these, I often find myself thinking um, for a m small or medium, mid-sized city, some of the solutions that, uh, that you're describing seem doable and clearly the evidence is there. Can this be replicated in a large urban center? Is it only possible because it's, you can get your arms around the problem? Well, what are your thoughts about whether this could happen all over the country. Yeah. I think it is happening all over the country, right? Like all of the solutions that you've heard us talking about are happening in large urban markets. Um, so tax credit developments, housing cooperatives, a variety of solutions for serving people experiencing homelessness. Well, I want to get back to Jim and, and uh, you know, what you were referencing earlier about the need to sort of blame or ask why people are homeless. And that's a, a, a epidemic all over the country. Everybody doesn't want it in their backyard. They don't want solutions near them. But there's also that extra level of, you did it to yourself or you didn't plan or you're, you're drinking or you're dr Talk a little bit about that in Missoula in terms of how that becomes a barrier. Again, I think it's if, if people will see them and hear, hear stories um, I don't think there's one story I've heard that I would not say if those things happened to me, I would be right where you are. Uh, to understand that it is a human challenge, it is a human problem. Uh, the barriers, one of the barriers then it, that I see is education. Helping our cities understand uh, how and why this is taking place and, and the nuances of all of it. Uh, so that education piece is, is huge in my mind. Let's take some questions here. Um, plenty of them, so let's get the mic going. Yeah, start back here and then we'll move forward. Hi, my name is Rihanna. Um, I work for Capital B News in Gary, Indiana. And for anyone that doesn't know, Gary, Indiana is a predominantly black city with over about 50 to 60% of the city being abandoned or just 
you know, <laughs> and something, one of the reasons I took the job, because I truly want to hold the state accountable for how they've let the, stere- the city deteriorate, deteriorate to where it is now. And I was just wondering, I guess, advice or anything that you got, because my uh, paper I work for is a nonprofit, so we really try to get into the community and do things. Um, so what advice would you have for anyone trying to get into this, uh, possibly helping with housing? Because I'm the business economic development reporter, so this is really my wheelhouse. <laughs> Um, so what advice or anything would you guys have for just something like this? I've got one. Okay, is this is a, um, a few years ago, we did a concerted effort with NeighborWorks and our other housing counseling agencies around the state to do something called Messaging Matters, where we started changing people's language about housing from units to homes. It makes, it seems like such a simple change, right? But who wants to live in a unit? (laughs) That's like measuring cups, I don't know. (laughs) Right, we wanna be in homes with our neighbors and that's where we envision ourselves being. So sometimes, especially working in technical fields like building houses and state policy and those kind of things, we get really into semantics and we start to lose the humanity of our language as part of it. And so sometimes just a shift of let's try using different words when we're describing things has been incredibly impactful. And I think in our state advocacy work, especially at the state level, the number of light bulbs that I so saw go on in places, I was maybe surprised to see them be like, oh, no, this makes sense to you. Um, that was really one of the things that I found really impactful. What the situation in Gary makes me think about in terms of corollaries in Montana is really some of our rural communities where we see um, a lot of disinvestment. We see changing demographics, right? Like an aging population, people having fewer job opportunities or resources. And there's a really amazing effort. I had it on my slide that um, Montana State University Extension has this reimagining rural And it's a little bit adjacent to Mm -hmm. messaging, um, just really taking this idea that rural communities and disinvested communities, often the stories are about what's wrong, what's not working, everybody's leaving, um, our community is failing or dying. And I think for the people who still live in those communities, it's very, it's really hard to hear those messages over and over. And what Reimagining Rural is doing is taking an asset-based approach to okay, well, yes, we know all of these things are happening, but what do we have that we can build on? What are the assets? What are the strengths? And I think in rural communities, what they're really pointing to is um, local leaders and people who are getting engaged in their community in a lot of different ways and bringing different and new ways of thinking about these community resources. So maybe it's a building that's considered blighted or a property that's been disinvested, what could that become? So really helping people um, start to envision the future and try to recognize the past, but really be forward looking as much as possible. Hi, um, my name is Nina Joss and I'm with Colorado Community Media, which is in the Denver metro area. And Kai, I know you talked a little bit about resident owned manufactured mobile or manufactured communities. And I've been covering that a lot in my area. In Colorado, there's a law that if a manufactured community is up for sale, the residents have 120 days to make an offer. Is there a law like that in Montana um, that basically gives them the right every time, or is it a different process? And if it's a different process, when does your organization come into that process? Yeah, so that's typically called an opportunity to purchase law. Um, And we do not have that in Montana. We have advocated it advocated for it in the last two or three legislative sessions, but there hasn't been much appetite in our state. Um, So we are competing on the open private market um, with other investors who are interested in becoming owners of those communities. We typically get engaged when a park owner is ready to sell. And so we'll negotiate a contract and a purchase agreement with the seller first, and then we engage residents because we don't want to create any kind of false hope for residents if there's not a real possible deal there. Yeah, but thanks for covering that issue. I know the issues in Colorado around this have been, uh, there's been some real challenges there. Yeah, yeah. 
Hi, I'm Desiree. I work with the Charlotte Observer as the growth and development reporter. And one of my questions is, um, how does the temporary outdoor sites work here? Um, what does that look like? Um, how is it helping folks? I also used to live in Denver, and that was a big topic in Denver, too. Um, you know, housing folks in tents, a lot of people were like, that doesn't help. But as you mentioned, the first step is to get housing that leads to stability. So just wondering, like, how does the temporary sites out here work and, and how is that helping those who are unhoused? Yeah, ours, uh, ours is, uh, first and foremost, it's a partnership. It's a partnership with uh, United Way and the county of Missoula. We could not do it without them. Our part in, in that is that we run the program. So, for example, when uh, after an interview process to see if uh, the potential client is ready to move forward um, or where they're at, they may not be ready to move forward, but we recognize they're ready to move forward. Um, they'll go for an interview process, have some rights and responsibilities, and then we provide programming from uh, one, of the, one of the programs we provide is called 6040. If they have an income, and uh, about 30% of those on the temporary uh, safe outdoor space are employed. Um, so they're not all unemployed. That's another misnomer out there. <clears throat> um, we, uh, we take 60% of their income and put it in savings. Uh, we don't gain anything. They gain the interest off that. But what they begin to see, and we have a couple banks come in and teach some uh, budgeting classes, what they can begin to see is, wait a minute, I can save some money. And uh, for, there, there'll be some that will just go, what? I can't do that. But then after they see that begin to build, and uh, whenever they need that for a reason, it, it's, it's a fluid account. They can pull it out. But we just encourage them keep it in there until you leave and then you got this nest egg for housing for a car for whatever that next step is so it's it's the partnership and it's the program that we have in helping people move forward 73 percent last year found housing and uh, well I, I, out of that 73 percent some went on to uh, inpatient care that they needed uh, safely reunited with their families uh, whatever that might have been but 73 percent found success up front. Um, I cover behavioral health in Philadelphia, and I'm used to the phrase meeting people where they are in terms of the addiction space, but I wondered if you could explain it more in terms of the housing um, context. Yeah, I, so with our partners, we partnered with several organizations to create Trinity. So Missoula Housing Authority, is our biggest partner, Blue Line Development, um, that does affordable housing, and our local behavioral specialists around town. So as part of the Trinity development, there's actually a navigation center that will hopefully, we are building those resources there so that as folks are finding stability with their housing, they can also find resources readily accessible. Um, like lowering those barriers one at a time <laughs> to be able to um, access those as they need them. So that was a really a learning opportunity we actually got from several other developments that have come before us. Uh, hi, I'm Nick Swartzell. I work for Cincinnati Public Radio. Uh, this is for you, Kaya. Um, I found the co-op housing idea like really interesting. I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about the decision-making structure and like what buy-in residents have, both financially and sort of how they help steer the fate of those buildings. Yeah. yeah, great. So the Wolf Avenue project is the first one we worked on here in Missoula. It's a historic building. It was an old taxidermy shop way back in the day. Um, and it's a building you couldn't build today, right? There's no parking, there's no setbacks. Um, so six units on a city lot. And a lot of renters who had been in and out of that property. Um, so we approached the renters when the property went for sale, similarly to what we do in a resident-owned community. And from there, really had some conversations with them about what are their goals. So um, are they looking for a wealth building opportunity? Is it important to them just to maintain stability? What does affordability look like for them? Um, and we even looked at, could we condoize the building? Could you own your individual unit? Like, really, what are we trying to accomplish here? Ultimately, 
most of the residents in that property were low or very low income, so they weren't going to qualify for condo financing um, or be able to bring significant individual or household resources to the table. So ultimately, um, really it's a very limited equity share. So we helped them each get a 0% deferred loan for a $15,000 buy-in to the co-op and they can earn up to 3% per year on that. So it's not a significant wealth building opportunity, but that because that was one of the things they all identified as being important to them, we figured out how to structure that in a way that was meaningful. Um, and then from there, you know, their board is made up of residents in the property, so in the traditional co-op model, yeah. And then the second one we did looked a little different. Residents there said, we don't really care that much about the wealth building, we just really need stability and we need affordability. So in that case, they each put in $1,500. That was doable for them. It looked more similar to like a first and last month's rent or a security deposit. Um, they're, not earning, they're not gaining wealth on that. When they leave the community, they just get that $1,500 back. Sorry, could you clarify just what happens with the ownership of the building in that model? Like, who yeah. takes it over? Is it your so the residents form a cooperative, so they, we help them establish a business together, and then that business owns the buildings. So they buy a share in that business, and they own and operate it. We play a role as a um, supporter, a technical assistance provider, and then we also often are a lender in those projects, but they own it, they run it. Is, is it through the lending that they're able to afford sort of the... Yes. Yep, exactly. Yeah, so we make sure that the financing is accessible to them. Yep. Yeah, and then in these, mod, the ones that we've done, the land is actually owned by the Community Land Trust. So Land Trust holds the land, Cooperative owns the building, and leases the land from the Land Trust. So that adds another really nice layer of affordability because the Land Trust buys the land, so it brings down the overall cost. Um, and then it also adds a really nice layer of community engagement and community investment because the land trust really supports the residents and the property long term. And is that model being used elsewhere? Yes. So there are a number of examples of co-ops and land trust and then in some cases the combination together. Yeah. You see it mainly in large urban markets, but we really look to um, Lopez Island has a really amazing community land trust that has done some small scale cooperatives. Um, and land trust, and then Vermont is often looked to as well as a place where there's a lot of innovation and these kinds of shared equity home ownership structures. Um, Let's go here, yeah. and then we'll go to Polly, and then to Brittany. Oh, you have a question as well. We'll get. We'll try to get as many as possible. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, Deanna Pistono. I'm at, I'm with MinPost. We're based in Minneapolis, and I have. Two questions, um, one for Jim and one for Kaya. Um, for Jim, I was wondering with reg like what policies does the temporary outdoor space have with regard to sort of familial setups as well as pets? Because I know that's something that can prevent people from going into shelter spaces where they're like, I'll have to give up my pet or I won't be able to stay with my family. And for Kaya, just to get all the questions out at once. Um, with employer-based housing, I would like to hear more about how it can be beneficial rather than contributing to a cycle of obligation and owing. Uh, we have 30 sites. Uh, they're 100 square foot. Uh, PalletShelter.com, if you're not familiar with them. They're only called pallet shelters because they come to us on a pallet, then are modules. Um, we, uh, at this point, we ha do not allow families and we, we heard about that, uh, but that's just a decision we made. Uh, we don't uh, want to bring and have children in a place that may not be safe. Um, so do we want other sites? Yes, we want to have 150 sites. We want to have more than that. If you listen to my director of outreach, she wants <laughs> thousands of sites. So uh, we've just made that policy at this time. Uh, no families. If you come in as a single, uh, you, you'll have a residence by yourself. If you come in as a couple, you'll have a, a residence together. And then with pets, uh, we have been all over the gamut on that. Uh, but if it is a service animal, they're able to come. But what we have found many times is that while they had a pet, they were not taking care of that pet. And so we work with our Humane Society and, and others here in town to make sure that animal is taken care of and to find out what, what again, what are they missing to take care of that? What, what needs to happen? Um, so we're, we're pretty selective on that just because uh, one pet can cause huge disruption. Uh, you, you didn't know that the, the guy next to you has a phobia about, you know, or whatever. So just 
uh, situation by situation. And in terms of employer-based housing, I think there have been some really great approaches, as simple as employers increasing their compensation and benefits package to support employees' housing costs, um, to even more kind of complicated programs of you know providing some type of down payment assistance or other type of housing support. I think when we get into housing that employers are developing and owning and maintaining and your residence is dependent on your employment, that's where I see a lot more challenges and um, places to be more cautious about what, you know, what's the trade-off there. I generally prefer models that are either some of the ones I just described or that go through an intermediary um, and, and don't have that direct, that direct tie. And then certainly if it is directly tied, having a good period of time for people to exit that housing if their employment ends so that it's not such a disruptive um, displacement. Hi, my name is Polly Dinetclaw. I am a political correspondent for ICT, formerly known as Indian Country Today. Um, I cover indigenous nations all across the country, so I do it from a national sort of perspective. And one of the things that I found to be really actually amazing is that Missoula has, hasn't had an exposure death um, in four years. And I come from a very small community of like 25,000. We have like at up to like the most we've had in the past 10 years is 10 exposure deaths, like every single winter. And so I'm curious about how one Missoula is able to keep the number of exposure deaths lower. Um, and then two, I'm also curious to know if Native Americans are overrepresented in the like homelessness population. Um, because as I was driving around Missoula, I noticed a lot of Native people experiencing homelessness. And so that's the first question that I have. And then the second question is, um, when you're renovating the homes, you talked about health risks. So one, what are the health risks in these low income and affordable homes that we should all be aware of? Um, and what specifically in Missoula is the biggest issue? Um, let's go for the exposure. I, I would say uh, the, the big issue, the big thing that's helped is the, again, the partnership with, uh, uh, we have a Pavarello, which is a, a no barrier center and they have uh, the hot team, homeless outreach team. Their team and our team work together really well, uh, as well as any other service providers. So we're, uh, as I was leaving the office today, uh, one of the staff said, hey, we're, we're going out to try to find this guy. Uh, so uh, across Missoula, we have a, a great group of people that are finding where are people, how are they doing, and can we get them into, into shelter. Um, uh, yes, there's a high percentage uh, that we serve of the native population. Um, uh, I would offer you some employment if you would want to come and help work with us and help us in that area. Uh, we're, we're doing our best, um, but we recognize there's some barriers that, that we don't understand um, and that we want to understand, but there is a high, high population of, of the of natives here that we serve. Part of the demographics in our properties, we also see a higher than our community makeup mm -hmm. of BIPOC populations mm -hmm. um, in our properties as well, residents mm -hmm. there. Yeah, systemic racism, mm -hmm. we'll just call it what it is. Do you want to talk about <laughs> rehab and how, yeah, yeah, I was. Uh, well, I feel like you have a lot to say about that. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. or do you want me to? to about all of this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would love for you to chime in, Kaya, yeah. too, if I go uh, too astray. I mean, the one of the things that is true about building homes that are affordable. Um, part of the ways that you can keep them affordable is to build them with less expensive things to start with. Um, right, the, the just as putting a building together, if you have less expensive materials, maybe you don't have to charge as much of rents. And I think, for example, in the Creekside development, they did their best in the 80s, but that was 30 years ago. <laughs> and products have changed a lot, our knowledge has changed a lot, and things don't last forever. These buildings aren't, they need to be maintained and they need to be, they're living things as well. They're, well. They, they breathe and they off gas and they do all the stuff. <laughs> um, so it's really important when we are thinking about like what we're gonna put back into them for safety and longevity. 
as well as those cost savings and things like that. You can build something really tight, but you have to know that if there's not enough air circulation, it may save you on energy, but that can promote mold growth. And finding the balance point between those kind of things is incredibly important in the architecture of a building. It's also important from a health and safety standpoint, um, not the physical environment, but also our social environment opportunities. As we become more isolated as a society, making sure we aren't building buildings that contribute to that. So that they have common rooms and spaces for residents to be able to gather, to build community in. Um, those are things that are really important in build, building practices that follow people first. Um, building practices and so those when we say health and safety it's like the actual health they have fire escapes and fire suppression systems and we try not to build in flood zones and we <laughs> like all of those like actual real safety things um, but it's so much more than that yeah yeah and I would just add I'm so glad you brought up the community connectivity piece um, flood zones are going to be a big thing right FEMA's rewriting all their flood maps and so that's going to change the landscape. Um, we see increasing climate impacts, in rising insurance costs as a result, and some challenges for owners in terms of maintaining buildings with those rising costs. So the, the relationship between these two things is continuing to get pinched. Um, and indoor air quality, I feel like, is a really big one for us, just making sure mold and other factors. Um, I would say in more rural communities or older housing stock, we also see a lot of work around pests, right? So um, that can be a real, a real quality of life and health issue that um, needs some rehab. So those are the, that's kind of my top list. We can take a few more questions. We have one here, and then we'll come back over to you, Mike. Hi, I work at Univision News Digital, covering issues related to housing, health, um, environmental issues through in Hispanic communities, particularly immigrant communities. Um, for Guy, I wanted to ask a little bit more. You, talk, you mentioned supporting 21 manufactured home parks in the state. Uh, if, you wanna, if you could zoom in in one particular case on what that support looks like, uh, especially in the context you mentioned of you know, greater demand for some of these parks to be redeveloped and sold. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so mainly we're, those 21 are all communities that we help to the residents purchase the property. And so those are now preserved as affordable housing in perpetuity. Um, we, it's a lot for residents to take on that kind of ownership role. And so we work with them for at least 10 years after purchase and support them with all of their community needs. So they are hiring professional property managers, they have an attorney, they have all of the regular kind of contracted services that an investor owner would have. But in addition, they have us as a support and we really work with them to make sure they know how to work with their property manager. Um, and then also that they are they have all the skills they need to work together effectively as a board and as a membership. So it's a lot of leadership development um, and a lot of just like being there to help them with whatever problems arise. Like I had one community I worked with where the day after they signed the papers and became owners, there was a big wind event and there were trees down on houses and right, they're calling like, what do we do? <laughs> it's like, call your property manager. Is everybody okay? You have insurance. Like just really being able to walk through, what do you do? Um, because it's a lot to own and operate a property like that. And, and do that with your neighbors <laughs> in a way that you don't all hate each other at the end of it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Michael Lyle. I'm a reporter with Nevada Current. We're part of the State's Newsroom Network. Uh, I've been covering housing policy and homelessness along with other things for many years. So I've heard many times the story that you you told about the woman that got her home taken from her because the landlord bought it and out from under her and just didn't have the income to find another home. It's happened so often like in my reporting and then there's other systemic barriers to getting into home whether it's rental application fees that they just can't afford because they're just priced out or uh, wage issues and so I'm curious um, some of these are actually kind of policy issues that 
just uh, that they're living by. Uh, I'm curious, how have some of the issues around housing stability and homelessness influence or shape some of the housing policy legislation here in the state or in the city level? Like, what are some of the systemic changes that you've seen as far as policies that are addressing some of the issues that you're seeing? Um, again, we come, go from my perspective. Uh, we and our team are so involved in the trenches that uh, we're not out there on the policy change. However, we work real close with, it's been mentioned, Missoula Interfaith Collaborative. And part of the way that Casey is uh, shaping Missoula Interfaith is moving upstream to some of those policies. So we are, are totally in communication with him and support of him as, as that's where some of the, we have to get upstream at, at every level and uh, getting some policies in place through leg legislation is really important. About five years ago, the city of Missoula adopted the first affordable housing trust fund in the state. So, um, that was a huge change at the local level where we were able to convince folks to put real dollars towards the issue in our community. Mm -hmm. um, so that is, has its fifth birthday. We're ready to do our first evaluation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. I'm glad you raised policy because it is really critical. Um, I think Historically, we've really focused on resource development, like what resources can local, state, and federal government bring to address the solutions that we're all bringing to the table. I've seen the conversation shift more into regulatory environment, so some of the like zoning and planning issues are really um, core both at local and state legislative levels, and I think are critical to this conversation. And then beyond that, you know, in Montana, like in other places, we see a lot of conversation around renters' rights and landlord dynamics. Um, in Montana, we have a really strong landlord lobby and it's very difficult to make changes in that space um, and actually constitutionally prohibited in some cases. So that's a space that I think um, is starting to get more attention and definitely deserves more attention, but it's hard for us to make change at the policy level. Is that frustrating? You keep coming up with these solutions, but then you have regular, you have <laughs> interest groups that are uh, essentially finding ways or, or still making your problems in, uh, even worse because they're not regulated. Um, there's no one pushing back policy wise. Um, like at the federal level, an example of this that I fight every day, I just can't, it's so. For those who are receiving Social Security income, Social Security basic, it's $943 a month is what a standard single person gets a month to live on. Um, the max asset limitation that they can also keep is $2,000. So I don't know if any of you have heard out there, like you should have three to six months of your income to replace in an emergency. They are mandated to keep only two. That's it. Julie might be a little frustrated. I am a little. <laughs> so those are policies that I do think just saying that out loud, like a basic financial practice that we've heard time and time for like basic security that you should be able to have three months of replacement income. And that at the federal level, policy prohibits that. that that's just a really frustrating thing that hasn't been changed in decades. Um. <laughs> I think the thing that I'm taking away from this training so far is the almost positive energy <laughs> that's happening in Montana around solutions. Um, most of our speakers who've talked about you know, Invest Health and now these housing scenarios, um, it's making me feel now that there are, there are solutions out there and that as journalists, our job again is to ask the right questions to understand these intersections between policy and real people's lives and how people are living. Um, and uh, they've now modeled for us some really, really wonderful programs and initiatives that again, go back, see what's happening in your community, see if, if they're doing these things. So I wanna take this opportunity to thank Julie Pavlish, Jim Hicks, and Kyle Peterson for an extraordinary uh, deep dive into the issue of housing and homelessness. So thank you all so much for being here. You're welcome. Thank You're welcome. you.